So I'm working on this track right here, and I'm using a bunch of little tiny short sound design techniques, arrangement techniques, composition techniques that I kind of wanted to share, because some of them seem kind of useful, some of them may be completely entirely useless and just only useful in the context, or not even useful at all, maybe I'm just doing something stupid. But, you know, who knows, maybe something will be useful. So I'm recording this video to share those with anybody who may be watching it. All right, number one. This is playing sounds or putting sounds in different spaces to create depth, meaning some sounds may sound really close and like intimate, and some sounds sound a lot farther away and quieter or more, more reverbed out. So, example, this sound here. It sounds very intimate and close to you because all the panning is going around you and it feels like it's just right in front of you, right? Like just, I don't know, maybe tickling your ears or like some ASMR kind of stuff. You know, you know what I mean? But then this sound here. Especially the reverb tail. It sounds like it's more in the distance farther away. So if I combine sounds like this or make sounds that occupy both spaces, like this one. You hear I'm automating a reverb send so that part of it is in the distance, part of it's up close. If I combine these, then it will sound a lot more textured and a lot more real. Like that. So, all right, there's number one. That's done. All right, number two. This is going to be creating or recording fully sounds, very long, continuous recordings of you just messing with things like maybe a Kit Kat wrapper or eating rice or a Doritos bag or just like moving around in your chair or something and then processing them but not past the point of recognition. And the reason I like to do this is because it sort of puts you in a creative space where like, oh, well, I have to use this thing that I recorded and it feels personal to me because I recorded it, but not processing it a lot keeps that sense of ownership over the sound. And it also keeps it organic, right? If you process something past the point of recognition, it's going to sound like digital goop. You should not, might not be what some people are going for, might be what some people are going for. But in this case, where I want something that sounds organic, that's not what I would want. I would not want digital goop. Okay, the third one is very similar to the last one, but it's more about just sounds that exist in general. So using real world sounds to make something that sounds alive. For example, right, this, um, these chords here sound like this. Both of these layers, right, one of them is a choir, that's just being low passed and compressed a little bit. Also got some convolution reverb on it. And a cello, I believe. Also with a bit of reverb and EQ. So when you combine this with the underlying texture that I established in this first section, it sounds more alive and like it's breathing, like it's organic and it exists and it's around you and it's actually doing something. All right, number four. Yeah, so this is the importance of a sub dead more su substance to a texture. So in this example here, I've got another chord. <laughs> adding to the, the width and just like, I don't know, feeling and emotion, not really emotion, but feeling of the chord is this sub here, which you certainly won't be able to hear if you're listening to this on a phone speaker. But if I take this sub out like this, it just sounds emptier and not, like it doesn't have any foundation to rest on. So especially in ambient, evolving sounds, it's very important to have a sub, even just something that's really weak, like this one. It just lays a foundation for everything to grow out of. All right, number five. This is the importance of pan automation to um, have more texture in a sound. So I've got this sound here, right? If I disable the, um, the pan automation on this track, uh, like that. If I disable the pan automation, just put it back to normal. 
It's just me scraping a plate. I think I was eating rice or something. But if I re-enable the automation like this, you might want to be wearing headphones for this to have its intended effect. It sounds like it's swimming around you or doing some sort of weird thing. It sounds more like it's just textured and in a space. Um, more things that are going on, creating texture. So this is what it sounds like in context. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. All right, number six. I think that's it. I might have lost count. Number six, using a reverb on only one channel. So I've got this full recording. If I take off the reverb, it sounds like this. I think it's me playing around with a wrapper or just handling some sort of object that I recorded and filtered and EQ'd very harshly, apparently. But once I put the reverb back on like this, you may notice that it's more in the left channel. So it feels more far away in the left than compared to the right. So this maybe gives the sound some direction or gives it more location in the mix. All right, number seven, I think. This is taking me to an entirely different part of this track. So for context, I'm just gonna play the transition into that part and then I'll get into the tip. All right, so what's, uh, what's the tip here? It's the automation on these. So I'm using Piano Tech, which is a really awesome physical modeling synth. And I'm here, I'm simulating a kalimba, and here I'm simulating a harp. And what I'm doing, I'm automating the parameters of the physical modeling. So it sounds real because of how accurate the physical modeling is, but it also sounds synthetic because I'm changing the shape, or not the shape, but the simulated shape and tension of this harp and kalimba. So if I get rid of the uh, automation on the kalimba, for example, sounds kind of boring and kind of yucky, but then when I re-enable it like this, it's just got more stuff going on, more texture, more diversity in the sound, just like almost every single one of the tips before this. All right, this eighth one, I think, I think it's eight, is not really a tip, it's just more of how I made a snare. <laughs> because I think it's kind of cool what I did. Or not cool, but just interesting in a way. Here's the part with the snare in it. And you know, it's got this snare here. And what's so special about that? Nothing, nothing at all is special about this. It's just operator with a triangle, and noise with a pitch envelope and a DS clap. That's it, that's all it is. You don't need any complicated wizardy for snares, except for maybe this Foley. That's just from a isotope Foley pack from, I think it's Break Tweaker. I think that's what the plugin is. It's from Break Tweaker. Just, I think it sounds pretty okay. I think it's a pretty okay snare. And, you know, it could definitely be a lot better. Maybe I could put a vocoder or a noise mode to bring out the tail or, or something. But the point is, is that you don't need anything stupid and complicated for snare sounds that work and point out in a mix. All right, number nine. This is using, this is for bass processing, actually. So here is a sort of acidy, distorted bass that I have. <laughs> It's not the best bass, but it's very wide, and I'm doing that using convolution reverb, or just convolution in general. So if I turn off the convolution, it still has the same sort of sound, but it's not as wide, it's not as textured. I feel like everything in this is just width and texture. Maybe that'll be the title or something. But yeah, using very short impulse responses, I have the uh, concrete bar left-right 
and the chambers in large rooms for hybrid reverb. It's just short decay, 50 milliseconds, nothing really special. I have to turn the width up a bit and change the EQ slightly. But yeah, using convolution, I, I feel like, tr I think trash, yeah, I'm using trash here as well. Trash is a convolution. I'm not using it though, I'm just using the actual distortion. Trash is a convolution section, so if you don't have Ableton and want to use convolution, trash is your answer there. So yeah, that's this bass. <laughs> All right, this is another thing for this buildup I have here. Well, not really a buildup, it's just a... I guess it's a buildup. Who cares? It's breaking up repeating sections with interludes. So I have this here. Where it goes into this sort of reverb out bit with the, uh, this thing. And I've also got that here. It does things. I've got some glitches here. Whatever. So breaking things up with those just spaces or even just cutting everything out with only a kick or only a snare for 20 milliseconds. It's not 20 milliseconds. That's way too short. But you know what I mean? Just adding those things that only happen once to make it feel like it's progressing. All right, I think this is the last one. Maybe it's not, but this is recording loops of just grooving on mundane objects. So, for example, I've got this this cup. It's not. It's not a cup. It's a glass. But I can just record myself hitting it or playing a rhythm on it, and then process it slightly to fit in the mix. And it just adds more percussion and more stuff going on if you want to do that. So this is me banging on the glass here. It's got some width automation stuff, but that's all it is. If I, if I layer myself doing that a bunch like this, there you go. You got a pretty cool percussion loop. So that's it. Uh, I don't think there's anything else. Thanks for watching. Oh, and uh, subscribe. <laughs>